It's the beginning of October 2022. A young American man is doing something spectacularly unusual. He is actually reading a newspaper. So what does he learn from this mysterious object of yore? Well, it's Jimmy Carter's 98th birthday. The US and Venezuela just did a prisoner swap, and it's the five-year anniversary of the deadliest mass shooting in US modern history. But the story that gets his attention is headlined, Ukraine has been turned into a giant scrap heap of Russian tanks. What's going on? What's been going on? That's what we'll find out today. It's true, if you went to certain areas of Ukraine right now, you'd find what look like graveyards for Russian tanks. The tanks, usually looking like they're well past their prime, are everywhere. You can see photos of them in the background as Ukrainians go about their normal day. Take for example the town of Izium in the Kharkiv Oblast province in eastern Ukraine. This place used to look majestic. These days, if you walk through parts of Izium, the word that would spring to mind is apocalypse. It was liberated in September 2022, but not before five months of fighting. When the Russians were there, they spent some of their time interrogating, torturing, and killing residents. One of them who survived later said he was interrogated and shocked by one of those old Soviet military field telephones. Another witness said, Russians wore masks and tortured civilians with bare electric wires. Mass graves were later dug up, with the Western media saying this was now a pattern of Russian occupation. We only know this, of course, because the Russians left in a hurry. They didn't just retreat, but they left all kinds of things behind, including quite a lot of tanks, some bashed up, some just abandoned. The Washington Post wrote, Ukrainian troops have documented war machines in various states, from combat-ready tanks to vehicles in need of repair. In some cases, Ukrainian forces have obliterated Russian weapons, leaving smoldering vehicles to be discovered by the advancing forces. In one of the videos, you can actually hear a Ukrainian talking about the Russian tanks as if they were the bounty of school kids' stolen candy. One of the soldiers says, you and I get a tank, we all get a tank, each. This was just one town. If you were to visit the town of Liman in the Donbass region, you'd see something similar. You'd find tanks all over the place, some of which have been damaged, but some that were abandoned in decent shape. What a gift that is to the Ukrainians. We'll come to the value of such tanks a bit later. One media report said the aftermath of the Russian retreat was a macabre scene. Bodies of Russian and Ukrainian soldiers were strewn all over the streets. A Ukrainian resident told the Ukrainian soldier, the smell is unbearable. Stray dogs have already eaten two of them. When are you coming to pick up these dead bodies? She might have also asked, when are you going to take all those damn tanks away? The retreat was described as embarrassing for Putin. Not only had the Russian army lost a lot of young men, but again the Russians had lost a lot of very expensive machinery too. The Guardian wrote, Video showed burned out vehicles, personal belongings, and dead soldiers strewn across a forest road. Ukrainian forces recovered at least one T-72 tank, which had suffered minor damage. Carnage everywhere, dead people lying in the streets, families found dead in their cars, and a great big pile-up of heavy-duty military weapons. You can read a news story similar to this relating to a number of places. Earlier in the year, news reports suggested that Russia was losing about five tanks daily. Then things got much worse for Russia when Ukraine began its counteroffensives in the east later in the year. The number of tank losses was then reported to be in the region of 10 tanks a day. These were T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s. Some of the T-62s that were destroyed or captured date back to the 70s, possibly even the 60s. Sure, the Ukrainians have lost a good number of their own tanks, but not anywhere near as many as the Russians, according to various sources in the Western media. The Russian media, of course, might put a different spin on things. No doubt both sides don't mind tweaking the numbers, that's war. But these tanks are proof that Russia has done extremely badly in the tank department. Ten tanks a day adds up to a lot. In October, Forbes wrote that total tank losses for Russia stood at 1,392, with 801 of them destroyed and the others still being repairable. We found a report from a Ukrainian source that said the Russian tank losses were more like 2,573 although that story was published two weeks later. Other reports stated that some of the abandoned tanks were in tip-top condition and still of service because Ukrainian ammo could be used with them. Some were burned and busted with Russian soldiers still inside them, usually three of them. Six percent of all Russian casualties in the war have been tank crews, according to one analyst. It must be a horrible way to die, being burned alive in a metal box. But it seems it's not out of the realm of possibility for a Russian soldier. Bear that in mind as we go on with the show. According to the website Global Firepower, Russia has a stock of 12,420 tanks and 30,122 armored vehicles. These numbers are for 2022, although we aren't sure if Global Firepower keeps updating the website since there are daily losses. 
Still, about 10,000 of the Russian tanks are in storage. For the ones being used, as you know, some are old, but some of them are modern iterations of the very able T-90. Now, we must ask why so many Russian tanks are decorating parts of Ukraine. If you were to ask an analyst, they might tell you it's complicated. They'll tell you that it's more than Russian tanks being obsolete in the battlefield. Let us explain. According to experts watching the war unfold, Russia has lost 237 T-72 B-3 tanks and hundreds more other iterations of T-72s that date back decades. The country has lost in the region of 170 T-80s, which were around the 1970s and were last built in 2001. So, yes, we have some pretty old tanks there. But there is more to the losses than many of the tanks perhaps not being modern enough for battle. The truth is, Russia has been using these tanks when they weren't needed or they deployed them clumsily. A military analyst based in the UK explained, tanks are supposed to fight as part of combined formations, but in terms of how they've been tactically used, Russia hasn't done that effectively. You see, tanks should be usually arriving on the battlefront when there is infantry and artillery close by to support them. Otherwise, close-range anti-tank missiles will take the tanks out easily. The best-case scenario for Russian tank crews? The Ukrainian anti-tank weapons and the people firing them would be destroyed or at least repulsed. This hasn't been happening anywhere near as often as Russian tank crews would like. We should also look at the billions of dollars the US and other countries are sending to Ukraine. A lot of the military aid consists of weapons that can easily destroy tanks, sometimes from a great distance, such as the US-guided multiple launch rocket systems. In September, the New York Times wrote that these have already helped deplete Russian tank numbers. But these are for long-distance warfare. The US also supplies some arms to Ukraine used for close-quarters combat, including various anti-tank systems. The weapons sent from the US include hundreds of Javelin anti-armor systems, each costing about $250,000. These weapons hit the tanks from above, where they're the weakest. They've been working out so far for Ukraine. The media reported the US has sent over to Ukraine 1,500 units of tube-launched optically-tracked wire-guided or tow anti-tank missiles. Along with those, plus the Javelins, the UK added a bunch of new-generation light anti-tank weapons. These short-range weapons can be easily transported on light-armored vehicles, and the US has sent millions of dollars worth of those over in its $54 billion package. So in terms of weapons, Ukraine right now is getting a lot of assistance. So, you have old tanks, sometimes traveling without enough support, going up against some of the most formidable anti-tank weaponry there is. Is it any wonder those Russian soldiers are leaving their tanks at the side of the street and running for their lives? All they really want in life is someone to love and friends to share the odd drink with. Being incinerated is hardly their ambition. This is important. The mental aspect, that is. This isn't the 1940s. Soldiers are not like they used to be, and their commanders are not anywhere near as brutal. Sacrificing oneself for your country seems like a raw deal these days. Although, it has to be said, back in the day, many Red Army soldiers hated Stalin and so weren't overly keen on fighting for him. Some are feeling that way now because, as we said, times have changed. Plus, some young men don't see Ukraine as a threat. Not a threat like the Nazis were. Some of them are more than willing to give up a hunk of their metal rather than be burned inside it. Some feel like they're being ordered around by idiots, pretty much sent to their deaths. As we said, the Russian war plan hasn't so far been great. Many news services are reporting about Russians who are no longer willing to fight. One of them told the BBC in May, I don't want to go back to Ukraine and kill and be killed. He explained, We were like blind kittens. I'm shocked by our army. It wouldn't cost much to equip us. Why wasn't it done? He said so often they were told to move forward without any previous reconnaissance and with no protection. He makes a good point. Many people have commented on how atrocious Russian strategic efforts have been. This year, the longtime political activist, among many things, Noam Chomsky talked about the utter incompetence of the Russian military. He's not alone in saying that. Scores of Russian soldiers who've been to the front line won't go back, and some who are there now are not willing to die. Some of them have seen traffic jams of tanks on roads when they were easily picked off by US and UK-made shoulder-fired anti-tank weapons. A Russian tank crew named Alexei was there for one such attack, later explaining everyone in the crew was shell-shocked. They had no idea what had hit them. This sounds like shooting fish in a barrel. What you have is inexperienced young men taking orders that even to them don't seem rational, moving around in old tanks against some of the best anti-tank weapons in the world. It used to be that tanks were the best things for taking out tanks, but now these lightweight weapons seem to be able to do the job and Ukraine is being sent them all the time. 
The Moscow Times wrote that some of the tanks that date back to the 60s have been fitted with makeshift cages on the tops. It's hardly what you'd call modern armor. The tank crews have also tried putting sandbags and pine logs on top of their tanks, but this won't help their chances of survival in any significant way. This is why some people say the tank age is over. They say tanks these days are just too vulnerable. Still, maybe this just applies to the old tanks. Even so, old and new tanks should be protected with Explosive Reactive Armor, or ERA, which does what it sounds like it would do. There's also Active Armor, which can sense incoming missiles and intercept them before they get to the tank. Why can't Russian tanks employ these features to defend themselves against missiles, then? By the look of the battlefield, you'd think these tanks would struggle to react to an incoming tortoise. Even so, Russia has been a world leader in tank technology and armor technology. So why are its tanks being taken out so easily? Even though Russia has the know-how to stop it from happening, one analyst had this to say about that. The heavy attrition of Russian main battle tanks in Ukraine is highly likely partially due to Russia's failure to fit and properly employ adequate explosive reactive armor. It is highly likely that many Russian tank crews lack the training to maintain the ERA, leading to either poor fitting of the explosive elements of it or being left off entirely. So, this is more a human failure than it is a hardware failure, but it's more likely a bit of both. It might be down to money. Can Russia afford to protect its tanks the way they should be protected? Half the world is helping Ukraine in this war, and almost no one is helping Russia. Over $100 billion has been sent to aid Ukraine in total. The amount of weapons in those aid packages is staggering. Way too many to list here. But be assured, the Western arms industry and its shareholders are having around-the-clock parties with by-the-minute champagne toasts just as Russian soldiers are being cooked alive by their weapons because no country is sending aid to Russia. But there's more. If you look at the video footage of Russian tanks being blown up, or if you take a close look at the dumped tanks, many of them have ERAs. Some don't, but that's probably because Ukrainians had already stripped them down. What does this mean? Well, firstly, there are various types of an ERA. Some are better than others. Also, ERA will help, but a strike can still be catastrophic. A missile can still lead to a deadly pop top, which means the turret is blown off. The sad fact is, for Russian soldiers, their armor is less effective than it should be, eight times less effective than a NATO tank, according to one expert. This means that the catastrophic kill rate in Russian tanks, especially the older ones, is really high. With the older tanks, it's more than just poor ERA or poor ERA management, but the tank's other attributes that are less than desirable. But as we said, it's more than just hardware. If you ask any analyst right now who knows this war inside and out, they'll also tell you that crappy tactics and appalling morale among troops count for a lot when it comes to that deathly landscape of fallen tanks in Ukraine. As for substandard tactics, Russian tanks often do a follow-the-leader movement, and that has been leading to bunch-ups, the fish-in-a-barrel formation. We made that formation up, of course, but you know what we mean. On top of that, as we said, you have lackluster coordination with infantry and artillery, which is just asking for trouble. Russia has done this time and again. Their tanks have been huddled up, left out in the open like blind mice among well-armed pigeons, and the majority of time, they haven't even had the slightest bit of camouflage. The era of the tank may not be nigh, but if you think Russia has the time and money to redesign tanks to make them less vulnerable, you'd likely be wrong. Still, Hitler did once underestimate Russia's weapon-building prowess. Right now, the worst job in the world has to be a Russian tank crew. Now you need to watch why life inside a tank sucks, or have a look at US World War III plan.